So uh, today's uh, Grand Rounds speaker, we're honored to have Dr. Len White, who I said at the outset was the winner of this year's Department Diversity Award. Len is the, uh, you know, as everyone knows, Ren's a, he's a phenomenal teacher and nationally recognized. He was the 2021 Alpha Omega Alpha Robert J. Glazer Teaching Award from the AAMC the Duke Alumni Distinguished Teaching Award, multiple golden apples, which are handed out by the medical student. And he is the founder of Coursera's Medical Neuroscience course, which uh, is rated as one of the best online courses of all time. Uh, he is a associate professor of neurology, neurobiology, orthopedic surgery, psychology, and neuroscience, and director of education at the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences. His PhD is from WashU in St. Louis. And today, Len's talk is going to be Visible Human Neuroanatomy, a guided tour with selected cadaveric specimens. So Len, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien. And thank you, Dr. Rose, for a very fascinating case. Uh, I'm sure we'll all uh, learn much as we um, think about the data that you shared. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is uh, have something of a grand rounds experiment. I suppose we've all been experimenting in grand rounds for the last few years, but um, what we're going to do today to conclude the Zoom only series of grand rounds is to have a bit of a tour of visible human neuroanatomy, if you will, I'd like to invite you to journey back with me to maybe your first or second year of medical school where you had the opportunity to put your hands on a human brain and examine what you can observe. This is something of an accidental tour in the following sense. All of the specimens that I have to show you here were derived from the cadavers that we use in our dissection courses with medical students, physical therapy students, and actually about five or six other groups of learners in the School of Medicine. These cadavers are all delivered to Duke through the Human Anatomical Gifts Program, which is just an incredible program that uh, makes all of the anatomical sciences that we do with human tissue possible. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you that to let you know that this is not a selection of autopsy samples, for example, which is no longer available for educational purposes. Uh, with our medical students. This is an accidental sample in, in the sense that we, we never know quite what we're going to get when we dissect a cadaver. And uh, thankfully, what we get is always a rich learning experience uh, for our learners and, and even for our faculty. So what I'd like to do is share with you uh, features of about seven different brain specimens, starting with a few that have uh, no uh, visible uh, pathology, and then we'll, we'll progress into specimens that do have visible pathology. Some we anticipated, but honestly, several that we did not. And the reason why we did not is that we get very little information uh, about these uh, cadavers uh, delivered through this, this program. We do not get medical records. In one sense, we have something better, right? We've got the actual body that we can take apart and learn from, but we don't have the medical records. We often have a single term cause of death and just very recently, we started to get additional information at the discretion of the family about what they might want us to know about their loved one. So with that as an introduction, I'll begin with our first specimen. And uh, for those of you who are noticing that we've got several cameras in play here, I want to acknowledge my good friend and colleague, uh, Rick Melgis, who's operating the technology today. Uh, Rick is um, an expert videographer and one of the most creative people that I know here at Duke. So thank you, Rick, for your help. Thanks, as always, to Will as well. Okay, so here we have a, a brain specimen where I have removed the meninges, the vasculature, and as you'll see in a minute, I've also removed the cerebellum and the brainstem. And this is just a marvelous representation of cortical architecture. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this in a while, uh, at least uh, in uh, cadaveric presentation, uh, just not to make too many assumptions here, we've got the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe. This is the central sulcus of the right hemisphere here, so precentral, postcentral gyri, 
superior, middle, inferior frontal gyri. And in the parietal lobe, we've got the intraparietal sulcus, so our superior parietal lobule, inferior parietal lobule. If I turn the brain so you can see the lateral perspective, we have our Sylvian fissure, temporal lobe, superior, middle, inferior, temporal gyrus, and the lateral occipital complex. We typically don't name sulci back there. On the ventral view of the brain, here now you can see that I have indeed removed the brain stem and the cerebellum for the purpose of revealing the cortical architecture of the inferior temporal lobe. So again, we have our inferior temporal gyrus, and then we have the occipital temporal gyrus, sometimes called the fusiform gyrus, and then our more medial gyrus, the parahippocampal gyrus, that forms this very distinct protrusion called the uncus, uh, visible on the anterior and medial edge of the parahippocampal gyrus. Now, a few other features in this particular specimen that are worth pointing out. Um, I preserved a bit of the vasculature. This is the top of the basilar, where we see very nicely its bifurcation into the two posterior cerebral arteries. These are beautiful arteries, some of the cleanest in our collection. Um, Rick, perhaps we can zoom just a bit more into this central region here. Very nice, thank you. Um, hopefully the focus will be sufficient for you to see these uh, very beautiful, thin, clear, clean uh, cerebral arteries. We'll see other examples in a minute that are not nearly so nice. And just because this is an interesting specimen visually, I'm going to uh, tilt it a bit more towards the camera and encourage you to peer down into this space where the brainstem and diencephalon has been removed. It looks like a pair of nostrils down there, doesn't it? Uh, hopefully those of you that are following along will um, appreciate the fact that these dark recesses, and I think we can back off the zoom just a bit, Rick. I'm gonna put a stick in there. Uh, you'll recognize that those are the interventricular foramina of Monroe. Uh, so the, the wooden stick now is penetrating through a foramina, uh, a foramen of Monroe into the lateral ventricle, specifically the left one. And then between the two is the column of the fornix, which forms the medial wall of that ventricular space. You'll also notice this. Um, structure right here, which is the splenium of the corpus callosum. We don't often think of the corpus callosum as an external structure of the brain, but this dissection reveals it as such. Now, if we can show the wider field view, just to once again see the entire brain, this, if I may say so, is one of my favorite uh, specimens in our collection. I know we're not supposed to have favorites, uh, whether it comes to our learners or our brains but uh, I've long appreciated this brain. I'm kind of curious uh, if anyone wants to hazard a wild guess as to the age of this brain at the time of death. Go ahead and pop it into the chat and um, I'll enjoy looking at that later. When I ask this question of students, of course, I'm trying to provoke a bit of their bias and a bit of their perceptions. So uh, Rich, I think you'll be pleased to know that this person was a bit older than 45 at the time of their death. This person was 101 years old at the time of their death. Wow. And yet this is one of the um, most full and uh, textbook-like specimens that we have. I'll show you an example, actually two in just a minute, from an individual who died with Alzheimer's disease and will contrast this appearance, particularly of the cortical surface, uh, with that specimen in just a minute. So I'm gonna move this out of the way and uh, bring in the next specimen, which is quite an unusual specimen in our collection. Unusual in the sense that it took quite a bit of effort to obtain this specimen. We started doing this a few years ago with ambitious students that wanted to take the time to essentially dissect the spinal cord and the brain together without uh, compromising them. So, so as those of you who recall a bit of visual embryology will know, this is not the entire central nervous system because we don't have the retinas still intact, but we do have the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, 
And I'm keeping this specimen underwater at first because I always enjoy showing the students the cauda equina as it's floating underwater. And uh, in this particular specimen, we actually have a rather distinctive phylum terminale, which I'm going to grab and extend out. So there's the phylum terminale. The rest of these processes are lumbosacral spinal roots. Uh, obviously, removed from the vertebral column, uh, the relevant anatomy that would be of clinical significance here is difficult to appreciate, but uh, still very nice uh, visible demonstration of the lumbosacral enlargement. Um, I've opened up a bit of the dura mater here, so you can observe some of the roots. We are looking at the dorsal aspect now of the lower thoracic cord. So these are dorsal roots that are passing through the dura mater and attaching along the dorsal root entry zone. We can um, observe some of the ventral roots at other levels. So up at the cervical cord, where unfortunately I did just a little bit of damage to the cord during this dissection, but Rick, if we can zoom in there, there, I think you can nicely see the ventral roots as uh, they are attaching here in the cervical enlargement. Okay, so um, I'd like to just highlight now, just real quickly, some of the vasculature and then some of the cranial nerves. So one of the nice things about this specimen is that we've preserved the place where the vertebral arteries penetrate the dura mater after running up through the um, lateral processes of the cervical spine to enter the cranium at the foramen magnum. So here we've got the two vertebral arteries fusing to form the basilar. And I think already you see vessels that are quite not as clear and pristine as the 101 year old that I showed you at the start. There is a little bit of atherosclerosis in this region of this basilar artery. Uh, branching off the vertebral, we have a posterior inferior cerebellar artery and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Uh, right there. At the top of the basilar, we have the split into the superior cerebellar arteries and then the posterior cerebral artery. And notice that this uh, beautiful ocular motor nerve slips right between the space between the superior cerebellar and the posterior cerebral. These are the internal carotid arteries here and here, joined to the posterior cerebral by the posterior communicating arteries. Come back to that in just a moment. And then the internal carotids give rise to their anterior branches, the anterior cerebral arteries. But I think you can see um, tucking into the lateral, sorry, the longitudinal fissure, just dorsal to the optic nerves, optic chiasm. Now, I need to tell you, some of you have already noticed this. When I first obtained this brain, uh, something caught my attention. It was the flattening of the right ocular motor nerve. Now, some of you may be wondering, is that an artifact? Did I do that in dissection? But others will know, actually, there is a clinically significant feature that can compress an ocular motor nerve. And when that thought came to my mind, I elevated away this ocular motor nerve. And sure enough, we have a sizable berry aneurysm growing where they often do on the posterior communicating arteries. Thankfully for this person, this aneurysm did not rupture, but it was sufficient to compress that ocular motor nerve, which again, without medical records, we don't know if this produced a right third nerve palsy, but the degree of compression suggests that it very well may have. Other cranial nerves to note, of course, we have the optic nerves. I'll be speaking to the residents about uh, the optic nerve in, in, in the noon hour and uh, more generally the visual system. And as we progress down into the pons, we have the root of the trigeminal nerve. And then just a bit more inferior at the junction of the pons and the medulla, we have cranial nerve six, seven, and eight the abducent nerve or abducens nerve, most medial, and then more lateral, the roots of the facial nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve, just lateral to it. 
Just below the vestibular cochlear nerve, I'll show you that here on the left side. Here's the facial vestibular cochlear nerve. We have the root of the glossopharyngeal nerve. And then these tiny threads here are the vagus nerve. I always like to tell the medical students the vagus nerve at the cranium is the most disappointing of the cranial nerves because the students are so used to seeing such a, a large nerve trunk in their dissections of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. And then they get up to the brainstem and they see it's actually just a fine collection of thin threads. Those, those of you as old as Rich and I might uh, recognize this as an old computer cable, like the old flat cables that we used to plug into the back of a motherboard on an old PC. And in this specimen, we also have uh, just a, a little view of the spinal accessory nerve uh, coming up through the foramen magnum, and then the roots of the hypoglossal nerve attaching between the medullary pyramid. Again, thanks Dr. Rose for highlighting the medullary pyramid in your case, and just lateral to it, the inferior olive. So um, this specimen uh, has uh, many features. Let's go ahead and back out wider view, Rick, thank you. Uh, many features that are worthy of closer study, but I, but I do want to move on now to um, a different specimen. So I'm going to make another exchange. And I want to show you the mid-sagittal surface of a brain. So here is a, a different specimen now. And uh, we've made a cut down the mid-sagittal plane uh, to reveal the cortical architecture of the mesial face of the hemisphere. Uh, here's the cut corpus callosum. And so right on top of the corpus callosum is our cingulate gyrus, cingulate sulcus, which makes this characteristic upward turn, the marginal branch of the cingulate sulcus, meaning the first sulcus in front of that will be the central sulcus right here. So this is our paracentral lobule. The mesial face of the superior frontal gyrus. Posterior to the paracentral lobule, we have the precuneus gyrus, which is becoming a, quite an interesting cortical structure in the field of cognitive neuroscience. This is part of what we now refer to as the default mode network, or it's a part of the brain that's actually more active when you're so-called doing nothing or mind wandering than when you're on task. Posterior to the uh, precuneus is the occipital, um, sorry, the parietal occipital sulcus and the occipital lobe with the calcarin sulcus running at roughly a 90 degree angle uh, to that uh, parietal occipital sulcus. Just below uh, the septum pellucidum, which is cut open, we can look into the lateral ventricle. I often like to encourage students to stick their pinky finger into this lateral ventricle and palpate the head of the caudate nucleus. We have quite a few specimens that have significant degeneration that will lead to a flattening of the caudate nucleus, not necessarily Huntington disease, although that's something we think about, but other kinds of uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Um, just inferior to that, of course, we have the diencephalon, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the brainstem below that with the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, with the cerebellum attached to the uh, pontine region of the brainstem. Some of you may, may be noticing that this cerebellum uh, looks um, a, bit, um, a bit withered, as if perhaps there's been some uh, degeneration, at least here in the vermis. Indeed, there has been degeneration in the cerebellum. There's been degeneration elsewhere in the cortex. For comparison, I'd like to show you the left hemisphere of this same specimen. The mesial face of the cerebral cortex looks quite nice. I would say by my judgment, no visible pathology, but the cerebellum does show some atrophy. And I think that is explainable in terms of the cortical atrophy that we find on the lateral surface of the brain. So if I flip this specimen over, now we can see significant cortical atrophy, which is consistent with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Of course, we don't make diagnoses in the cadaver lab. We only point out consistencies. This specimen, this cadaver did come to us with the medical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but we haven't done a histopathological 
confirmation of that diagnosis, but we do know widespread cortical atrophy involving the parieto-occipital sulcus, uh, the superior temporal sulcus, other temporal sulci, to some extent, the inferior frontal sulcus, and something of a surprise, fairly significant atrophy in the pre and the post-central gyri. So here's our central sulcus. We, we typically would not expect significant cortical atrophy of the pre and the post-central gyri in typical advanced Alzheimer's disease, but we have some significant atrophy here. Now, this is this, this person's left hemisphere. The right hemisphere is similar in these respects, but there is quite an additional significant visible pathology that I'd like to show you. Again, here is the mesial face of the hemisphere with the exception of the uh, somewhat atrophic vermis. Uh, the cerebral cortex looks quite full and otherwise uh, quite typical. But when I show you the dorsal lateral surface, we see severe cortical atrophy, much worse actually than what we observed in the left hemisphere. So if I can turn this around just a bit for the camera, try to maintain it in this position, there is a striking arc of severe cortical degeneration. And some of you will recognize the anatomy of this arc. It appears to be at the watershed of the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. So again, without medical records, I'm only making a somewhat educated guess, but this looks to me like a stroke of the right internal carotid artery that produced a watershed infarction where these two main cerebral vessels come together, the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral. So that would be our watershed zone. So Len, can I ask you a question here? Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Fang. Uh, uh, do you see any atrophy of the vessels? Uh, not in this specimen. There, there's, there's not uh, too much visible to see. Here, for example, is our anterior cerebral artery, which again, looks uh, quite typical for a catadark specimen. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fang. Thank you. Okay, so it appears as though this person experienced Alzheimer's disease and a significant uh, vascular event uh, that that person survived. So I want to show you now some coronal slabs from a person who died without much visible pathology of any sort. And in comparison, some slabs from comparable sections from a person who died with advanced Alzheimer's disease. I think this uh, low uh, macroscopic view is sufficient for you to appreciate the difference. So this is a typical uh, brain that we might uh, reveal on brain cutting. Uh, note, for example, the size of the ventricles uh, being uh, rather, rather typical. Uh, here's our caudate nucleus, for example, that's bulging into the lateral ventricle. Maybe not quite as large in volume as I might anticipate, but still um, well-formed uh, without uh, too much visible pathology. Actually, if, if we could zoom in to this region right in here just a bit, Rick, um, there, there is uh, something that I'd like to point out for the benefit of the residents. Uh, you may be able to discern there are some white blotches here in the striatum. Here's the putamen, the head of the caudate, the nucleus accumbens. Uh, this is indicative of chronic hypertension with the uh, white patches surrounding uh, cut lenticulate striate arteries cut in this slab here. So what appears to be going on here is uh, some reactive gliosis or in the perivascular region of these lenticulate striate arteries, which tends to uh, happen uh, with chronic hypertension. So this isn't quite etat criblé, as some of you may know, uh, on MR appearance of the striatum, but uh, this, this specimen is 
was advancing towards towards that state. So with enough of uh, this burden of this reactive gliosis, we might in fact have some compromised movement disorder. Okay, so again, let's let's back the, out to the view of both. And are, are the holes that we were seeing there in the similar area, are those dilated perivascular spaces? Yes, that's my interpretation, Dr. O'Brien, thank you. So obviously the, the most striking difference that you see here are the enlarged ventricles, uh, but also again, massive cortical degeneration, uh, very much enlarged uh, sylvian fissures bilaterally. And then uh, perhaps most striking of all is the near obliteration of the hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe. So uh, grossly enlarged temporal horn of the lateral ventricle here. Uh, and quite interesting, uh, again, a very um, interesting point to make with our students, a beautiful brain stem. Okay, here's a little bit of the substantia nigra, the dark pigmented structure, great ocular motor nerves here, um, exiting just medial to the cerebral peduncle. So it, it demonstrates that, that so much of the visible degeneration that we see in advanced Alzheimer's disease is uh, cortical and specifically it is associational cortex. Although as I showed you in the previous specimen, not always, we had primary sensory and motor cortex involved with degeneration there. So um, always uh, like to just highlight a bit of the, of the extremes, but with some, with some caution, because as our um, memory specialists would be quick to say that not everyone with Alzheimer's disease has this degree of neurodegeneration. So we shouldn't take this to be as typical of uh, a patient that you may see in your clinics, but uh, rather it would be typical of someone with advanced disease with uh, clear radiographic degeneration. This is what we might find at, at autopsy. Okay, um, I wanna turn next to another specimen that I have to share with you that was one of those unexpected cases. I was doing a brain cutting with our neurology residents a few years ago, thinking that I was cutting a typical brain with no visible pathology. And very quickly, we got into the forebrain and realized we had enlarged ventricles. So we first encountered those enlarged ventricles here near the frontal horn of the um, lateral ventricle. Very quickly, we noticed that there was some clotted blood on the ventral aspect of the lateral ventricle. The ventricles were enlarged. Uh, the third ventricle, the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles also enlarged with blood. So we knew we were dealing with a hemorrhagic stroke of some sort. And when we eventually got into the region of the hind brain, we discovered the source of the stroke. And that source was very likely the superior cerebellar artery causing a um, intraparenchymal hemorrhage that uh, ruptured the structure of the cerebellum, bled into the fourth ventricle. So the fourth ventricle very quickly became full of blood and that congested the cerebral aqueduct, even the third ventricle. Rick, if we jump up to this slab right here, we have the third ventricle full of clotted blood and that accounts for the en enlargement of the ventricles. Interestingly, when we looked at the lateral ventricles, the blood had settled, settled on the ventral aspect of, of the ventricle, suggesting that this person actually was um, at least uh, in a somewhat upright position for some period of time prior to death, um, th which allowed the blood to settle on the ventral aspect of the ventricles rather than the posterior aspect of the ventricles. So um, there's another stroke case I'd like to, to show you. This was much more subtle. Again, something of a surprise. Also in a brain cutting I was doing for uh, neurology residents and advanced practice providers. This specimen is um, quite unusual for the focal region of destruction. So I was sectioning through this brain 
uh, through about the first uh, anterior half of the forebrain and everything seemed to be going quite well until we got into the medial temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. Rick, if we could just uh, highlight this slab right here. Yeah. What you'll notice is that um, there is a beautiful amygdala in the right hemisphere, this large mass of gray matter here in the anterior medial temporal lobe. In the left temporal lobe, there's a, a large hole which is continuous with the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. We see some structure coming at us in the floor of this temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. That's actually the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. In fact, uh, when we go back one more slab, we see that the hippocampus is present, but it appears as if there has been a lesion that has destroyed selectively the left amygdala. Um, one of the activities I enjoy doing with medical students as an optional co-curricular activity is uh, brain drawing sessions. Medical school comes at our students fast and furious, and I encourage them to take a step back to think reflectively with introspection as they're learning about the neurological sciences. To invite them to do just that, I've partnered with the student leaders of our anatomy drawing program, which is an optional co-curricular program that runs the length of the first semester of medical school. And at the end of that program, we have two sessions where I invite the students to slow down their learning, their thinking, their appreciation of the human brain, and have sessions devoted to drawing brains. The first session is devoted to specimens that do not have visible pathology, and the, and the second is devoted to a series of specimens, including some of those that I've shown you today that do have visible pathology, including this very uh, slab of this particular brain with this vacuole, uh, where once the basal division of the amygdala resided in the left hemisphere. I have behind me an illustration that was created by a student, actually just a copy of an illustration that I'd like to show you. What this student chose to do was to represent the visible left hemisphere in grayscale, more or less as she was able to appreciate it by focusing on this specimen. And on the right, we have a much more fanciful and obviously colorful representation of what the student imagined life might be like without an amygdala. And as the students uh, learn from me, the amygdala is uh, something of the brain's early warning uh, system that's sensitive to um, potential threats, uh, potential provocations that might elevate one's sense of, of vigilance, uh, in anxiousness, depending upon the activity coming out of the amygdala. And I think this is a, a wonderful representation of uh, a student uh, thinking emotionally, uh, applying themselves with reflection and introspection with what they are observing and what they are learning. Well, I have one final specimen to show you today. And uh, it's a specimen that I will include a comparison slab for you to appreciate what we first observed when we performed this dissection. So we have um, some coronal slabs here and we will focus on the upper two. And what we have here are corresponding slabs from, from two different individuals. Here on your left is a coronal slab from an individual who passed without a medical diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And to your right is our uh, featured specimen that I'd like to draw your attention to. This is an individual who did have idiopathic Parkinson's disease as we were able to confirm with this dissection. Now, just to orient you, here's the uh, forebrain, the thalamus, just lateral to the thalamus, the posterior limb, the internal capsule streaming down into the brain stem. Uh, here's the region of the midbrain and the pons cut in an oblique angle. And I'll draw your attention to the substantia nigra pars compacta. Substantia nigra meaning dark substance, and we can see this visible dark substance, uh, which is a pigment called neuromelanin that accumulates within the cell bodies of neurons that synthesize dopamine. 
So this is telling us that there is a healthy complement of dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain of uh, this particular specimen. Now contrast that with our featured specimen, and we do have the pars reticulata of the substantia nigra, which gives it a somewhat brownish appearance, but there is a marked reduction in the amount of dark pigment. There's just a bit of dark pigment here in the medial portion of the right pars compacta. But otherwise, this is what a neuropathologist would observe at dissection of a brain autopsy from someone with the medical diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So this is visible confirmation of that diagnosis. Now, one feature that makes this particular specimen quite so unusual in our collection is that this individual was the first to come through our anatomical gifts program with bilateral deep brain stimulation. Uh, and, and the students that were performing the dissection got just a bit eager as uh, they discovered these electrodes penetrating the skull, and they actually manually removed one electrode uh, from the left hemisphere. They kept the one in the right hemisphere intact and proceeded to uh, dissect this brain, making these coronal cuts. And I'll draw your attention to the region that sits just about a centimeter anterior to the substantia nigra. So this is an adjacent slab to the one I just showed you. So here again is the thalamus, the posterior limb of the internal capsule streaming towards the brainstem. We are right in the posterior part of the diencephalon, about to meet the midbrain here at this section. And just anterior to the region of the substantia nigra, we find a lentiform gray matter structure, which is the subthalamic nucleus, which is the most frequent target of deep brain stimulation for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And as the students proceeded with that dissection, they made an extremely fortuitous cut here, which allows us to appreciate a small indentation just to the lateral and central portion of the subthalamic nucleus here in the left hemisphere. So I hope you can see that indentation. That indentation was left by the tip of the deep brain stimulating electrode, which we have, and I will place it back into this position so you can see roughly where this electrode resided in the brain with the tip, leaving this impression that we can see right there. So the deep brain stimulation electrode is implanted. There are four contacts and presumably the very distal tip, the very distal contact was situated there in the lateral central region of the subthalamic nucleus. Now, this is also a very special case for other reasons. This is an individual who is known to the Duke neurological community and uh, um, also um, has been disclosed to, to myself as the, the lead educator in this series. Uh, this person uh, graciously donated his remains through our anatomical gifts program after receiving care in our movement disorders clinic and having the care of my wife, who's a geriatrician here at Duke for the final decade or so of his life. And he and his family were um, really pleased to grant permission to allow me to use this particular specimen in demonstrations such as this and to share just a bit more than we typically would do about what we know about the course of illness. In this individual's case, the deep brain stimulation intervention had a tremendously positive impact on the final decade or so of this individual's life. And uh, while we know that uh, this intervention uh, has its inclusion and exclusion criteria, and there's certainly risk involved, nevertheless, in this particular case, um, it was uh, a most welcomed and very much appreciated intervention, as was the care throughout the neurological community of providers here at Duke, as well as in geriatric medicine.
So with this case, I would conclude our time together. Uh, thank you for your attention. And um, I'd be delighted now to address any questions or hear any comments or reflections any of you may have. Len, that was um, spectacular. And I also want to extend a thanks to Rick for just phenomenal videography there and your both of your perseverances through uh, the technical snafu. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I don't know if there are any questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask one. I mean, what is the motivation of most people that you know of that that donate their uh, their bodies or their brains like this. Uh, great question, Rich. Thank you for that. I think the motivation is an appreciation that there is good to be done through donating one's remains to a medical school like Duke. And while there are so many ways that grateful families, grateful patients can give, perhaps the ultimate gift is the gift of their physical remains. Most of these folks have some connection to the field of medicine, perhaps through a family member, or perhaps uh, just an interest in recognizing that one can benefit a um, fairly broad cohort of individuals who would have the privilege of accepting one's physical remains. I've been at this long enough at Duke that I have had the privilege of leading students through the dissection of two of my friends Whoa. who have signed up with our program in at least some measure because of my friendship and because of their interest in um, benefiting their students. And um, I won't put you on the spot, Rich, but I don't mind saying that I myself am seriously uh, considering lining up to um, also register my body, which gives us an interesting opportunity to tattoo messages to the students, right? To, to give them some pointers, give them some words of encouragement. I, I wanna get in better shape, Len, before I, uh... Donate. <laughs> we we take all comers. Uh, well, not exactly true. We don't we don't accept pediatric uh, cadavers, and we don't accept cadavers that have uh, too much trauma associated with with their presentation. Uh, that was that was remarkable. That you know, it, all just comments, no questions, just comments on how wonderful an experience it was. You know, as I was saying, when you were trying to fix things, uh, looking at an MRI is still awe-inspiring for us, but nothing like the presentation that, that you put on, both you and Rick, and, and we thank you so much for, for doing it today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to Rick Melgis for his expertise today, and I, we do apologize for the Wi-Fi failure in our... Uh, we... All right, Lynn and Rick, thank you so much. Everyone else, stay safe. Do good work. Cheers. <laughs>